everyone, and welcome to another episode of Decades La Salle Season 2. Who do we have here? A lady boss in the house. And during her time, let me give you a short description before uh, we, we have a chat with her. During her time as a public official, she was dubbed as one of the most popular cabinet members <laughs> during the Aquino administration from 2010 to 2016, popular because she was the strictest government official, because you, all of you, have to pay your taxes. So, in this decade's Assault season two, we'll get the softer side of no less than former BIR Commissioner Kim Henares. Hello, Kim. How are you? I'm fine. Thank you for inviting me. <laughs> how does it feel to be back here at the De La Salle University campus? I'm always happy to come back to La Salle because Why? every because every time I come back, I see something new. Mm. So I always said this is a school I don't regret paying my tuition fee to because every time they <laughs> put it back and build something new, something's going on. That's and right. So now that you're back on campus for this interview, <clears throat> what new thing have you seen or noticed on campus? Actually, while driving through Taft Avenue, I saw several halls. Which I never knew was there. Yeah. So I for I don't I cannot keep up of what the names are. I think there were two holes going through here, no? In between the condominiums. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Quite a number. Yeah. Even when I graduated, well, my entry level was eighty four, graduated eighty eight. It was just basically three so, buildings: the La Salle building, the SJ building, and the Saint Benil building. Yeah, and the middle ground of football court. Where, where's the football field? I don't know. <laughs> Maybe it's upstairs. Maybe it's upstairs. It's not anymore yeah. on the ground. So, um, you were only in De La Salle Taft, Kim, for two years. Two, and you graduated and... here yeah. uh, in La Salle. So, where were your first two years of college? Uh, I spent one semester in UP. Mm -hmm. Then one and a half semester in Holy Spirit. Then I spent the rest of the, my years here taking all my accounting subjects. So why did you decide to spend the rest of your college career here in Taft? Well, because they have the best accounting. I the best. Huh? Yeah, accounting program. Mm. And during my time, all the accounting teachers were good. I don't know now because I've not met any of the accounting students to be able to discuss it with them. But when you take a look at the, uh, how would you call that? Passing rate. The passing rate or even, not the board. The board, right? The yeah, CPA the board. The CPA board. A lot of our Lasallians are usually at the top 10 yeah. list. Yeah. What makes uh, Lasalle uh, thrive uh, in accounting? Well, I guess they have first... Before you can major in accounting, you have to pass a departmental exam, right? And I think very few people pass it, uh, right? And then when you get into the accounting program, I'm talking about my time, okay? oh. I don't know about now. Then when you get into the accounting program, you have to maintain grade point average. Mm. If not, you're kicked out of the program. And what was your grade point average, Kim? High enough not to be kicked out. <laughs> I don't yes. recall anymore. It's high enough to be in the dean's list, sir. Oh, there you go. So, yeah, yeah. And to be in the dean's list, yes, you yeah. have to have at least an average of 3.0 and above. Oh, you still okay. remember? You still remember? No uh, more. Your, your final grade? No because more. Of, maybe it was a 4, Kim. You're just I have being no idea. Modest. No, I have no idea <laughs> anymore. I'm, so, not, I'm a student who's not very particular about my grade. Okay. I'm very particular about... The teacher teaching me yeah. well. So, do you still remember your uh, accounting professors? Among them, uh, Professor Magpayo. Mm. Uh, I think the others I don't recall anymore. And why did you decide to take up accounting? Why not political science, management, marketing? Well, first, because I topped the departmental exam for mm. accounting. Mm -hmm. And second, there were some professors advised me that uh, you should take accounting as your first degree so that you can take the CPA board. Now, if you want, let's say, economics, you can always have a master's of economics. Right. Right? Then 
I was deciding to go to law school. Mm. And I don't want to be a litigator. I really want to be a corporate business lawyer. So accounting is a perfect match. Yeah, that's right. They say that's the best combination not to be a CPA lawyer. So from TAF, you migrated all the way to Katipunan. Not Katipunan, Or, HP de la, de la Costa. Uh, HP. Because that's where, oh, had the, that's that's where right. the school is, the law school. So you went to uh, UP Law, and then you No, also, not UP Law, uh, Ateneo, Ateneo Law. Law. And then you also went uh, to Georgetown. Yes. No? Uh, were you always uh, studious? Did, were you all, did you always love to study? I love studying. Mm -hmm. I love studying, period, whether numbers or anything, just studying. I think life is really a cycle of studying. Mm. And if you decided not to take up uh, accounting or even law, what would you have been if you, if you did not take up doctor. this course? Ah, a doctor. What I kind of doctor? I want to be an oncologist. Oncologist. Yeah. Oh, that's what Specializing in cancer. cancer. Yeah. Oh, oh. Why? Why did you want to be? Uh, if ever you did not become a CPA lawyer, why a doctor specializing in oncology? First, a doctor because I think uh, being a doctor, you don't have to ask the reason why you were born in this world. Right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Your relevance is immediate, right? Uh, oncologist because I find. Uh, I want to find a cure for cancer. That's right. Yeah, so that's why it's... Yeah, it's a very deadly disease. And up until today... Yeah, although like to some people said, why do you want that? You want you get uh, depressed. Well, I said, you know, the role of a doctor is to help. Mm. But the doctor cannot say you live or die. You can only help. It's in God's hand whether you live and die. So why should you be depressed? And in your two and a half years here in Dasal. What made it memorable, apart, of course, from being one of the top accounting schools in the country? Well, in hindsight, this is also the school where my husband graduated. Oh, okay. And we graduated together? Not, yeah, and without us knowing that we graduated together. Uh -huh. October 1980. And what did your husband take? Policy. Policy, political the science. science. Yeah. And here on campus, where would you be hanging out? I don't hang out. I, I come to school, go home, come, uh, go to work with my dad, then go home, then come to school. It's that routine. So home, school, school, school home. School, home, and work for my dad. <laughs> for your dad. And were you active in any uh, extracurricular activities here at De La Salle University? Only in the Anglicom. I mean, most people. <laughs> yeah. In, yeah. Uh -uh. Were you active also in, in school politics? No. Uh, no. <laughs> no. Actually... You're like, apolitical. Yes. Actually, I was saying, if you ask all my classmates, I'll be the last person they'll think of that will go to government. Mm -hmm. Because it's never been in my career plan. And uh, we'll get to your uh, government career uh, in a moment. But first, after uh, graduating uh, from uh, De La Salle University in 1980, you came back in 1982 to 83, and you wanted to give back. You wanted to teach La Salians to be top accountants. The Purpose of coming back is so I was asked. <laughs> you were asked to teach. Yeah. You were asked to teach. teach yeah. So how was it like teaching, uh, being a student, graduating, and then two to three years later coming back here on campus to teach the Salians accountancy? I appreciate the difficulty of my professor before. Mm -hmm. All the difficulty they might have, they must have faced, no? Because it's tough teaching student, especially some student. Always try to cheat. <laughs> <laughs> cheat? Yeah. Do the Salians cheat? <laughs> Some of them. But it's so hard to uh, cheat when it comes to accounting. Because you have to balance your ledger up That's to what the last you think. centavo. That's what you think. Uh, there's, there's a way. <laughs> They copy from each other. <laughs> and, and surprisingly, Kim... Why did you only teach for one term when you could have spread your knowledge to many more Lasallians? If I had, you know, if I had <laughs> taught for more terms, I would have been known as a terror teacher here. Okay, no? oh my God, a terror Because teacher not only in school, but a terror as well in, the, in government service. All right. <laughs> if I had continued teaching that class, I taught two classes in that term, okay. I would have flunked three-fourths of the class. 
Did you really flunk three fourths of your class? Oh, I passed all of them. Oh, oh wow! Then she she would really have the greatest <laughs> class. I would date her class for accounting. So why did you why did you pa- why did you pass them if they if three fourths of the, your students deserve to fail? First, it's accounting too, so they have to go to accounting three and four pan. So it's not as if when they pass my class, they go to accounting already, you know. Then secondly, it, the term ends on the Christmas. And third, I said, I don't want to teach anymore. So I said, okay, I'll just pass everyone. That's why when people got their class card, they were not, they were so frightened, they didn't look at it. But then suddenly you hear everyone screaming outside. <laughs> and those three fourths. Uh, as long as you did not drop the class, you uh, pass. You pass, you yeah. pass. So and those who drop the class regret it. Oh, gosh, that's right. And I'm sure they were all lining up the next term. The next term to take your class because you pass everyone. Yeah, but I was not teaching anymore. <laughs> and okay, from hindsight, no. If you fail three fourths of the class, those those who those who deserve to fail, what grade did you give them? If you still remember, the lowest ours is four. Yeah. The highest, no, the one is. One is the lowest and four is the highest. Yeah, then fail fail is one or zero. 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 Ah, okay. So, but those who deserve to fail. But you still passed them. You gave them one. one. Yeah. Okay. That. Oh my goodness. My gosh. Thank you so much for your kind heart. That uh, a lot of these Lasallians who got one, maybe right now, are working for top accounting firms. Do you still know some of them? I don't think they were because they were not accounting majors. Ah. They were from the uh, other business majors. Mm. So you're uh, two and a half years here in Lasall. What did you bring with you out to the real world from the Lasallian education. Well, I guess the Lasallian education is making you down to earth, mm-hmm. looking at things on a practical term. Uh, Isn't that the same as well for others for other schools? No. <laughs> other schools are uh, more well because Lasall is really famous for its business course yes. and engineering course, yeah. while the other schools are more famous for their liberal arts. Right? Liberal arts are more philosophical, more up there, mm-hmm. right? The, here, we're, we're grounded. Yes, here, we're, we're grounded. grounded, yeah. Mm-hmm. Do you still remember your student number? No. <laughs> <laughs> Do you still have your student ID? I don't think so. <laughs> no, we're, on this, we're in the same boat. Yeah. <laughs> we're in the same boat. Here. I've already lost my card. I also don't remember my number. Yeah. But we, at least we know uh, our year of entry. Yeah. And that is in 1976. My entry here? Yeah, no. Yeah. Ah, no, 1980. 1980. Yeah. 1980. Ah, no. 1980. My entry 78. here is 78. 78. Okay. So, uh, wow, what a memorable uh, stay here uh, in La Salle, no? But of course, you've taken those values, you've taken that education to your government service. So, why did you decide, of course, from private practice, why did you decide to throw your hat into the lion's den? and join government service? Uh, my first stint in the government service is, was I was between jobs. Mm. Uh, and I met Commissioner Paraino, who passed away recently, when he became Commissioner of in, yeah, mm. when he became Commissioner of Internal Revenue. And we just met on a reception January 2. And he asked me to go to BIR to help them because they were going to impose VAT on financial institution. Mm. And when I went there, January 7, I wasn't able to leave anymore. So he asked me to help. But along the way, uh, Mar Rojas appointed me as BOI governor. Mm. So that's the Board reason. of Investments. Yeah, board, yeah, governor of Board of Investments. Which is part of the Department of Trade and Industry. Industry. Mm. So that was March. Then August, I found another appointment as deputy commissioner for BIR. So for more than a year, I was doing two jobs. Mm. Governor, Board of Investment, and Deputy Commissioner of BIR. But I'm getting only one salary. <laughs> because you cannot have two compensation. Yes, yes. So there, that's my first stint in government. Then after a while, I left. After the, uh, when they appointed somebody as commissioner, after Commissioner Paraino left, right? Because of Hyatt then. I see. That was way back in the early 2000s. Yeah, right. 2003. Under the uh, Makapagal uh, administration. administration. So, um, what was the experience like? Uh, would you have wanted 
would you do you did you love your your service uh, in government or would you have rather stayed in the private sector? That's my first team. My second team is with Pinoy. Mm. My team with Pinoy was very gratifying mm. because we were able to do something for the country. And during that time, I always said that being commissioner of BIR is a difficult task in itself. But I think among the commissioners, I have the easiest task because the president and my secretary of finance allowed me to do things in the way I want to mm. do things there. So they did not really meddle, and we were able to do what we have to do. But you were called uh, more like a terror, a, ter a very strict and uh, disciplined to, uh, BIR commissioner. According to Pinoy, I'm the person that people feared most in the Philippines. Yeah, feared, yes. yes. And how important is it, especially now to all our Lasallians who are watching us right now, how important is it, Kim, for people to pay their taxes? Well, you know, if you don't pay your taxes, there will be no roads. There will be, you keep on complaining about the airport, there will be no airport. Mm. Uh, you're complaining about, as it is, we're not performing well in education, right? In public school, there, there's a study that grade five student doesn't even know how to read, right? So if you did not pay, Taxes, there won't be school, so probably grade 11 people won't know how to read, right? What else you won't have? Yeah, but people are saying, look at the roads today. And dami pa rin potholes. We don't have enough bridges. We don't have enough uh, budgets for the education. So why should we pay our taxes? Because our hard-earned salaries, which and part of it, which we pay for taxes, we're not seeing in the government service. The first Services. place. Yeah, but our obligation as a citizen is not only to pay taxes, mm. but to monitor that it is spent properly. Mm. And among the process of monitoring spending it properly is electing the right people to govern us. You cannot complain that it's going to somebody else's pocket when you are the one who elected them, right? That's right. So it, it's, it's also on you. Yes. Because you're electing these government officials, so we're not doing their, their job. job. Yeah. Right? Yes. Yeah. And of course, you, you need a credible, trustworthy government officials to run our services. Yeah. And we should run our service in a transparent manner. Mm. No? so that people will be forced to be honest. Mm. And, and, and during your time, um, what, what reforms did you institute to improve uh, the payment of, uh, of taxes among our kababayans? Yeah, actually, we were the one who implemented the EBIR form online. No? So we instituted it in such a way that if you're not paying any taxes, you're just required to file, you do it online. That's why now you can you will no longer see long lines on April 15 because people who don't have to pay just file it online mm. and we've been then that's been used up to now uh, you can actually so a lot use, of the best practices that you've instituted during your term continues to be used in the succeeding administrations because we always see uh, a, a disconnect from one administration to another right I mean, some, yeah, that's just address, our sickness. Yeah, that's our sickness. We always shoot ourselves on the foot. And yeah. we really discontinue the, the practices or the initiatives of the previous administration, even though it's they're good. great initiatives. Yeah, because unfortunately for us, we they're, normally they discontinue because they cannot get credit mm. for it. And we want to know a little bit more about your personal life. What time do you start your day? Depends. Now I'm semi-retired. Huh? So, yeah, because I just have a few consultancy. Mm. It depends. So if I have a meeting early, I can wake up early. If I have a meeting late, then I, I, if I have, don't have anything to do, then I wake up late. But normally, I get to bed around past midnight already. Why? Why do you go to bed past midnight? Because I catch up on everything else that's happening in the world oh. and in the Philippines. Do you still like watching the news? I do online. I don't. Ah, on demand. Yeah. On demand. Yeah. Like what kind of news do you watch? I Just don't... national news, international news, or Both. do you only watch uh, opinionated programs? 
don't I seldom watch opinionated program. <laughs> I just read the news. Mm. Yeah. So it can be local, it can be uh, overseas news, international news. Mm. So a lot of people also wanted to know, Hakim, do you have a social media account? Are you on Facebook? Yeah. You're on Facebook? Yeah, wow. but my posts are more spiritual. Okay. Why spiritual? Well, I guess uh, for me, because I'm a Christian, mm. I think part of the role of a Christian is to be a witness to other people and to share uh, what God's message is. Mm. And basically what I share in my Facebook is my devotion every day. You know, every morning I wake up, Who I do it. Who is your morning. devotion to? What do you devotion mean? to Mother Mary. I'm yeah. a Christian. I am a Christian. Yeah. Christian. So I don't worship saints or Mother mm. Mary. But we all believe in God, right? We yes. We believe in God as the almighty uh, um what well, person? my definition is as long as you know the salvation message, mm. then you're a Christian, whether you're a Catholic or whatever sect. All right, teachings, teachings about um, our faith and our... Uh, but do you also post uh, things about uh, your, your attending a party or no. with friends? Why not? That's, 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 that's for Facebook. That's social media. Because for me, it's um, a form of flaunting. Mm-hmm. And I don't think it's for me to do that, right? So are you just on Facebook? I'm sure you're also on TikTok. No. <laughs> I'm not on TikTok. Wow, that means. But for you to say that you're not on TikTok, that means you know about TikTok. Yeah. <laughs> and I know that the United States is banning it. Oh, there you go. <laughs> she really knows the news. Yeah. <laughs> uh, what about IG? Are you familiar with IG? Instagram? In, yeah. Oh, there you go. My God, the IR commissioner knows Instagram. Are you on Instagram? I'm on it, but I don't post. I just, you know, one of the when I was a commissioner, one of the things that I looked at are Instagram, Facebook, and all the billboard to determine whether. To determine. Yeah. Hindi ba parang uh, what do they call that again? Network method. Network method, and also if. The people who are supposed to pay their taxes are flaunt are not paying their taxes, but are flaunting their wealth. Yeah. So where did you get your wealth? Yeah. So that's also one of the sources of <laughs> uh, investigation. Oh, but how important is it uh, for government agencies and for government services to be uh, to be on the digital platform? I think it's important to communicate. And to inform people what's going on, uh, for in in terms of those things, I think it's important to be in the digital platform. Mm. So, uh, are you also on Snapchat? No. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm sure, uh, Kim, you were on Friendster before Facebook. No. Uh, see? <laughs> wow. So just basically Facebook. And then you have an account on Instagram, yeah, yeah. which has no posts. No, yeah. <laughs> and I think I have an account in X or Twitter. Oh, ah, there you but go. The, X but or I don't have a post also. Ah, so there. basically, the, 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 uh, I'm a lurker. You're a lurker. Yeah. There you go. There you go. But uh, what do you think right now <laughs> of uh, the use of social media, especially for news? I think you have to be. The problem with social news in the social media is you have to be able to discern whether these are real news or fake news. Because there's a lot of fake news in social media, mm -hmm. so you might be misled by what it says, right? And I think uh, for the young people, they should minimize using social media and be more interact personally with people oh. because I find that they're, because of too much social media, they don't really interact with human beings, mm -hmm. right? Which is true, yeah. no? But you know, we on Decades of South Season 2, we have uh, guests, some of the top social media content creators. And guess what, Kim? They have 1.3, 1.6, 2 million followers. So, I mean, it's, it's, it, that's the way they interact right now with their uh, fellow kababayans, and it's not only that. They make money out of it. Well, I 
if that's what they want to do, that's fine. Mm. I'm just talking about the young people, no? Because life is interacting with fellow human beings. Mm. Mm. You cannot not have that skill. Because if you don't have that skill, you cannot really go ahead in life, right? And you will get depressed. That's why you hear a lot of young people committing suicide, right? So I think I'm just talking about the young people. Mm. Now, if you want the to... The Gen Zs and the Millennials. No, it's not Gen Z. Millennials is already 20 plus. Oh. Eh, yeah, yung mga bata ngayon. Yeah, mga Gen Zs, no? Mga Gen Zs. Meron na bang... Uh, alpha na ro. Alpha na? Tinan mo? I'm even behind the curve. Hindi ko na nga alam kung... Nga... Sino ba mga alpha dito? Ah, walang alpha. Eh, what about mga Gen X? <laughs> ano ba yung Gen X? Ha? Huh? Ano mga ba yung Gen X? Mga between uh, 50 and above. <laughs> Well, I guess by that time, if you have not developed the skill yeah. to communicate with your fellow human being, I think it's already too late, right? So, you finished accounting, and um, a lot of Lasallians, of course, want to be social media content creators. They want to make a lot of money. They want to join the private sector, join a top multinational company, a local conglomerate. Um, would you advise them straight out of college to join public service, government service? Oh, I think they should go uh, to the private sector, develop themselves, and then go to the, the then after that, build a, finan make yourself financially stable so that you don't have to depend on government salary or bribe. Then you go to government sector because that's where you want to do public service. Mm. But if your desire is not to do public service, well, don't go to government. I think that's your contribution to nation, nation building. building. Mm -hmm. Don't go to government if your desire is not public service. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But are there some individuals that are built for government <coughs> service that would like to serve the people instead of uh, being in the private sector? Yeah, there are people who are like that. No? It's really up to them, no? uh, especially if their family is from a political family, right? Or if their families are already rich and they find that the, the way they need to give back to the country is to go to government service, why not? But there's a caveat because going to government service. No? I always say uh, in you have to have that kind of strength of character. Mm. Because you have to know that whatever you do, 50% of the room will disapprove and 50% of the room will approve. Mm -hmm. So you can never make everyone happy. You have to have a mindset that you are there just to do what is right. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't matter what people think about you or whether they like you or not. Yeah, that's uh, very important because when you get into government service, you're really thrown into the lion's den. I mean, being BR commissioner from 2010 to 2016, I mean, social media was already so active at that time. So what do you say to your bashers? I mean, on social I don't media, read it. you don't read it. That's why I don't see the basher. <laughs> what, what, what about on print, on TV? Oh. What do they say about Kim Henares being a very strict VIR commissioner? Too straight. Well, they never said that to my face. <laughs> if they did, I would have answered them. <laughs> oh. yeah. And what would be your answer to them? Well, you know, the problem with people is that what I did during my time is I just interpreted the tax the code law. strictly. Mm. In doing so, because I want everyone to have the be able to decide, everyone mm. in BIR and also the taxpayer. The funny thing is in trying to make myself exercise less discretion, people feared me more, mm. which is baliktad. The reason why I strictly interpret it is I have to make my life easier. Mm -hmm. no, but So my answer to them is, you know, if you don't like the law, you should go to Congress or Senate and have it amended, not come to me. Mm -hmm. no. So no one is mm -hmm. above the law. Yeah. Follow the rules and regulations, and you are just following the Constitution and the BIR code. Yes. Yeah, and The tax code. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's simple because if I do that, my relative, my friends cannot argue with me. Yeah. Right. And we have some questions uh, here uh, from our Lasallian uh, community, uh, Kim. Uh, one is, 
how were you able to hurdle this male-dominated world of government service, the BIR, and, you know, um, law and accountancy? How were you able to break the, gra the glass ceiling? I never felt that, in fact, for me, in government, I felt that there should be gender education for the male rather than the female. Because if you look at BIR, there's a lot of the heads are girls, mm. not male. I don't see any, any gender thing that I should break. You know, because in government, there's a lot of female that's, that's managing their, the head of their office and all those things. Mm. And uh, we have a, a scholar who has a question for you. Uh, let's hear her question. And it is from Ira Romero. And this question is directed to you, Kim. Let's listen to her question. Hello, Dirty Humanians. I'm Ira Miti Romero, the current uh, political science and accountant teenager. And I would just like to ask you this question. Given that our field of study is a borderline between public and private service, I would just like to ask you the current challenges you are facing alongside a call for motivation for the current Lasallian scholars who wish to pursue the same path as you. Well, I think first you should uh, learn as much as you can about your field of study. Uh, it's continuous improvement. No? You, uh, learning never stops. No? And secondly, I think, uh, like I said, uh, you should be at the stage of maturity where when you go to the public sector, you are mature enough to face all these detractors, all the influences that will be put on you no? to be able to uh, do what is right. Mm -hmm. That I am assuming you're going to public sector because you want to do what is right. Mm -hmm. Because otherwise, right, we don't have to discuss it anymore. Then while you're in, uh, in the public sector, of course, you still continue to learn uh, wherever, whatever field you are in. There's always something new going on. Like for example, in taxation and accounting, there's always new businesses, new products. So you have to be on top of all these things. Mm. So you should be able to determine how you will, if you're in accounting, how you record it. Is it an asset? Is it a revenue? And how you will tax it? Uh, when do you tax it? What the valuation and all those things? And of course, globally, there are movements. No, I'm a member of a think tank globally talking about reforming tax in the international uh, field, no? about making sure taxes are collected fairly among all multinationals. No? So these are all live issues that's going on, so you have to keep yourself abreast on this. Whatever you learn, whether you're in the public, private, or public sector, it, you, it's beneficial to you. It, make, it gives you advantage when you go back and forth. No? So, mm. You know. mm. so we have to continue to learn. We have to continue to be creative, innovate. Mm. Every day It's like uh, still a learning process for all of us uh, professionals. Yes, right? whatever profession you may be. Yeah, yeah, whatever profession you may be in, you have to continue the learning process. Yes. Okay, um, uh, uh, one other question from a student. Uh, from LaSalle that wants to ask you is that uh, what challenges did you face after graduation when you started um, your profession, when you studied law, when you, when, you got, when you passed the board, when you took up law, you went to the States uh, for further studies, and then work in the private and uh, public sector, what challenges did you face? What problems? Well, I think the one problem also, be, uh, I, I mean, there was a point in my life where I have some problem with my employer, mm. right? Because I'm a compliance officer. I think a compliance officer is the most difficult task in any corporation because you're a conscience of the company, right? So it's a competition between the company wanting to earn money and you as a compliance officer telling them you cannot do it this way or that way, right? But along the way, there will always be friction. No? So uh, the thing there is, do you want to live by your principle or do you want to go with the stream of things? Yes. Right. But for me, I think at the end of the day, if you live by your principle of what is right and what is wrong, then people will recognize it 
and your you respect yourself and people will respect you mm. and the other thing that i've learned through life is be patient if it is for you it will happen don't force it because in my experience like uh like for example before i went to law school in ateneo mm. i wanted to go abroad to study my law school my dad said uh, why don't no oh, don't why don't you just study in Ateneo? No? So I did not argue. Mm. So I studied in Ateneo. Then when I was studying in Ateneo and taking the after graduation, taking the bar review, my dad said, Isn't it you want to go abroad to study? <laughs> why don't you go abroad and study? Don't take the bar anymore. So that's how I went abroad. Then when I came back, my dad said, isn't it you want to take the bar exam? Or why don't you take the bar exam? That's what I meant about being patient. Yeah, being, being patient, patient and of course, listening to the wisdom and advice of your parents. Yeah, eventually, if it's good for you, it will be given to you. Yes, indeed. And thank you so much, uh, Ira Romero, for your question. And of course, thank you, LaSalle, for your continuous effort in supporting our scholars and our students through the program LaSallean Giving. And to our dear alumni who also want to leave a legacy and strengthen our animal spirit. You can also support DLSU through its several projects and campaigns. We have our scholarship programs through the LaSallean Legacy Fund. We also have projects to support our athletes through the Sports Animo Fund. And we also give opportunities to students to harness their creativity through the Seats for the Arts Fund. You can also help build the faith of the LaSallean community by donating to the Santuario de La Salle, located on DLSU's Laguna campus, the Santuario de la Salle is the first sanctuary built in honor of our founder, St. John Baptist de la Salle. And for more info, you may email edwin.reyes at dlsu.edu.ph or advancement at dlsu.edu.ph. And now, here's a very interesting question for you, Kim. What is the most interesting or most ridiculous myth you have heard about us? The Salians. Well, for the pre-college people, but the Lasallians are people say they're conyos. Conyo, uh, social. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but I think it's more for the elementary and high school. In high school. What about yeah. here in Taft? Well, in Taft, uh, it's not a myth. It's a reality that we're very firmly grounded, mm -hmm. right? And I think the men for others. Men for others is the other side, right? I <laughs> know we're also men for others here. But that's one thing. Uh, the only thing I think lacking to me in Taft is the spiritual aspect. Mm -hmm. It's not so much emphasized, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Brother Bernie, listen. Uh, we have to enhance the spirituality of all Lasalle. <laughs> yeah, it's more the academic, the sports. Mm -hmm. And uh, lastly, please complete the sentence, Kim. I am a Lasallian, of course, I am blank. I am continuously improving myself, like the institution. It's continuously improving itself. That's wonderful. Yes, we continue to improve ourselves personally and continue to learn. Yes. Uh, not only, uh, I mean, not, not only from, from school, but also from our peers in, yeah. in society, yes. right? Yes. Oh, thank you so much, uh, Kim. Uh, for joining us and for gracing this episode of Decades La Salle Season 2. Thank, Thank you for you inviting so me. Much. Oh, you. it's wonderful to see Kim in person. I haven't seen her in person in many, many, many years, but I've had Kim on my program to talk about uh, taxation. Uh, taxation, taxation, and that was only via Zoom, right? That was via Zoom. Uh, okay. <laughs> I mean, you're always, you're always guest on many, many programs yeah. in different networks. And we've learned so much about our chat here with Kim today in this episode. Transitioning from private service work to making tax collection more efficient amidst the many challenges of our country. And it's not easy. And you have instilled with your various experiences the best practices in public and government service. Thank you so much, Kim. We are very proud of what you have achieved for La Salle in the private and the public sector. Yeah, a lot of it has been because of my LaSalle education. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. And with that, 
we wrap up this episode of Decades La Salle Season 2 with no less than former BIR Commissioner Kim Henares. Maraming maraming salamat po. Animo La Salle. We'll see you again in the next episode of Decades La Salle. Thank you, Kim. Thank you <laughs> for having me. Decades La Salle would like to thank our sponsors.